tell us a little bit more. We just got the China PMI numbers, and it still shows a bit of an uneven recovery there. What does Fortescue's read on the recovery in China right now? And is it safe to say that in terms of steel output in 2020, it could stop, it also top, I should say, last year's volumes? Well, we've already seen good calendar uh, year performance in Chinese uh, crude steel production. So for the first quarter, Chinese crude steel production was around 234 million tonnes, and that was actually up 1.2% year on year. And throughout this whole period, we've seen very strong un uh, underlying demand for iron ore. So we've been shipping in accordance with our usual schedule, and we've actually seen iron ore stocks held at ports in China actually been drawn down quite significantly as well by just over 11 million tonnes since the end of uh, 2019. So we are seeing economic activity resume and pick up. We're seeing steel inventory start to decrease and we're seeing very strong demand for iron ore. And that's evidenced by our record third quarter that we've just announced where we've shipped 42.3 million tonnes in the third quarter. And that is a record for Fortescue. And uh, for the nine months, we're at 130.9 million tonnes. But we've seen when it comes to the steel industry in China, they, they've sent up a warning as well in terms of the nationwide stockpiles. We just showed a chart of that uh, when it comes to construction staple steel rebar. That swelled to a record in March. Does that in any way dampen the expectations of Chinese imports? It did swell to a record at March, and we were actually monitoring that very closely because it is an indicator of, of economic activity. But we have seen that those stockpiles have started to reduce uh, as we came into uh, into April, and that really coincided with some of the easing of restrictions on the movement of finished steel products around China. So we are start, starting to see those steel inventories come down. And whilst they did peak at the end of March, they were still only a, a tiny proportion of the overall steel production last year of nearly a billion tonnes of crude steel. So whilst there was that increase, as we've seen economic activity recover and we're starting to see those stockpiles draw down, we certainly aren't seeing any impact on demand for iron ore. We have seen some supply disruptions for iron ore from um, other producers. Um, in Brazil, for example, where there was exceptionally wet weather in the start to this calendar year, and for some of the other producers in the Pilbara where we operate, they were, they were impacted by uh, wet weather as well. So a combination of some supply disruptions Coupled with what we're now seeing is that resumption of activity and the drawdown of steel inventories is really underpinning that strong demand for iron ore. Now, Elizabeth, we're seeing miners cut their forecast for CAPEX. Uh, will that delay any of your projects? Are you intending to perhaps cut down spending? We're, we're continuing with our major projects. So we've got two major projects under construction at the moment. First is the Elawana Mine and Rail pro, um, project, and that's a $1.275 billion project that will reach peak um, construction numbers at around about the middle of this year. And we're on track for first or on train in December 2020. And our other ma major project is the Ironbridge Magnetite project, and that's a $2.6 billion investment again in the Pilbara. And that's first uh, magnetite concentrate on ship will be in the first half of calendar year 2022. So we're not certainly um, slowing down on any of our investment. In fact, we're, we're really committed to these major projects. Uh, they are creating jobs, creating up to 5,000 jobs during construction and 1,500 jobs once operational. So we're talking about your commitment yep. to perhaps dividend payouts. Can you maintain the dividend payout ratio given the uncertainties that we're expecting in, in the global economy? Well, we've just recently reiterated that our dividend policy is a payout ratio of 50 to 80 percent of net profit after tax. So that, the final dividend will be a matter for the board uh, at the end of this financial year. But, you know, we did end March with $4.2 billion of cash on hand. And for the first time since the company started shipping iron ore, we've actually ended in a net cash position of $100 million. So, you know, the, the balance sheet has never been in better shape. We've had record uh, shipments for the first nine months, and we've just upgraded our guidance of shipments for the full year. So we are actually in very good shape. Our costs have remained low. We're generating very strong margins and we've got a strategy for growth. So, you know, we're in a very, very strong position as we move forward. Uh, Elizabeth, the pandemic is front and centre and we know that Australia is trying to push for a probe to do with the coronavirus. Uh, and the Chinese ambassadors come out to say that 
if Australia continues to push for this pro, perhaps uh, Chinese uh, consumers will stop buying Australian wine, Australian beef. Are you perhaps concerned that uh, Chinese steelmakers may decide not to buy iron ore from Australia? Well, look, I think our relationship with China is built on decades of a really strong bilateral and respectful trade relationship. Uh, West Australia is a core supplier of iron ore to China, and, uh, and, and we've been I'm dealing with our Chinese customers for 17 years now. We've got very strong and multifaceted relationships with our customers in China, and we're certainly very committed to the strength of that trading relationship. My expectation is that the Chinese steel mills see us as a very core supplier to them, just as we see that we had very strong relationships and we, we've got a team that are based in China as well. We've been working closely with them as well through this pandemic and they've, uh, they've assisted with procuring vital medical supplies for our West Australian healthcare sector as well. So our, our relationships are very deep and multifaceted and we have a very strong trading relationship and I'm very confident in the ongoing strength of that relationship. Okay, good relationship with China. We were talking a little bit more about the, the, the stockpiles we've seen there. The profitability of these uh, steel mills in China has been hit, though, from this virus. Does this change your strategy in any way in terms of shifting into higher cost and higher quality iron ore? Well, we've, we've got a m multiple products that we sell to our customers. And again, we've been a core supplier of iron ore to China for some time now. And actually, what we've actually seen is that with those steel mill margins under pressure, we've seen very strong demand for the products that we sell to the market. Uh, so we see that on, ongoing strong demand. We've seen actually margins have or spreads have narrowed between the pricing of various products. And certainly uh, the, the impact that we've seen on, on the sector and margins more, more broadly has actually resulted in that very strong demand for those products that are in that sort of 58 to 60 grade of iron ore content. And, you know, many major mining companies like Fortescue, you, you certainly have the balance sheets right now uh, to really kind of sort of rival uh, some of your competitors out there. Are, are you seeing any kind of M&A opportunities out there, given just how distressed uh, the rest of the industry is? Well, I think you're right. I mean, we're, we're in very good shape, and our balance sheet has never been in better shape. But we do have two major projects that we're in uh, in the process of, of constructing, and they are significant investments in their own right, you know, close to $4 billion US dollars. So we've got a strategy for growth, but we do have an active business development team, and, and they look at opportunities. And, uh, and you know, we, we actually have focused more on exploration. So we've been putting money into the ground to explore uh, for other commodities, including copper, in, in Ecuador and in Argentina. So that's been our focus in terms of uh, growth and diversification. But we certainly are very active in looking at other opportunities that may arise. Now, Elizabeth, S&P has just filed a lawsuit accusing your company of suppressing information on global iron ore prices. Uh, what is your response to that? Um, well, this is an ongoing uh, matter that, you know, there's, there's, there's commercial sensitivities in that, but um, it's really to do with the disclosure of what is confidential information, and that's really all I can say on the matter.